Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us in today's webinar. After a month of intense Bordeaux 2020 releases, um, today's tasting is with Comes Obreon, and um, this could not be more apt to round off this campaign. Well, uh, we were very excited when WineClick was offered the opportunity to host a tasting webinar with Comes the Obreon. That must be about two months ago, two, two to three months ago, where we started preparing for the vintages and um, how we're going to run the event. And well, um, this is a property that has Obreon in his name and um, with all the history and the story behind all the wines with Obreon. And that is not just the only highlight, it is also the winery that's closest to the city of um, Bodo. Exactly. Well, um, yeah, enough of all these little, little, little notes. So uh, we are pleased to have Miss Alice Lioret, the brand ambassador of Combs Obreon, to share her knowledge with us today. She will guide us through a tasting of four different uh, vintages of Combs Obreon, as well as a second wine, C, the Combs Obreon. So um, without further ado, let's begin. Let me hand the stage to Alice and um, we can discover the, the property together with her. Alice, please. Many, many thanks, Alice, for introducing uh, everything and um, highlights very, a few very important points. Um, so we are going to start uh, the tour here, so virtual tour, unfortunately, still a, a virtual, but I hope one day uh, I, I could welcome you here at Carmo Brion. Um, so Welcome here. I'm very happy today to, to share this, uh, this opportunity with Wankly uh, to make you discover here uh, Carmo Brion and uh, this day. So I'm going to 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 the view now. And uh, so we can start our small tour in the vineyard here to be at Carmo Brion. So as you said, I list before, um, there are, we have two specificities here. Uh, when like in general about this vineyard, about this one estate, um, I can see we are at the heart of Bordeaux uh, and we are really like located in Bordeaux. I mean, it means that our location, the address and even the postal code is Bordeaux here, which is very unique uh, actually here because we are the only one state from the Bordeaux region to be located actually at the heart of, uh, of Bordeaux. So, so very, uh, very important for us. I will explain later why, but especially because we have a very... Uh, specific climate and terroir being located here uh, in Bordeaux. Just because I see the horses now, I'm, I'm just going to talk about it now because they're going <laughs> to go away again. But uh, we work sometimes with horses here at Carmo Brion and this day especially because as you can see, it's very, we have a lot of mud. It's very muddy because we had a period of rain like for the last 10 days, the past days, let's say 10 days. So it's easier for us now to work with uh, the horses. Uh, and especially what they are doing now, as you can see, we are plugging like the soils to help actually the soils, uh, to, to help the evapotranspiration from the soil. It means that we have too much water in the soils. So uh, we, we help actually the water to go out from the soils uh, to, 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 to let the soils and the, and the vine breathe again. So this, this, was for, this was for the horses. And uh, so, as I told you, no, we are at the Art of Bordeaux. And then I want maybe before talking about really us, maybe to talk, to say a few words about the history. Oh, the horse again. Uh, to, 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 to talk about the history. Why? Because actually we have a very, very, very long history. And this all like became in the 16th century when actually Carme Aubryon, so the, the, the current estate, used to belong to Chateau Aubryon. So as you may know, Chateau Aubryon is one of the five first growths uh, in Bordeaux. And actually what happened at that time is that um, the, the, the owner of Aubryon, so it was the name actually of the wall place, was Jean de Pontac. Uh, so he was actually the uh, owner of Aubryon and Carmo Brion at the same time. So it means that it used to be the same wine estate. And of course, as you know, so it's, it's a proof for us that we have a great terroir as Aubryon is now classified first growth um, in Bordeaux. So, oui? Ah, attends, je tourne. Let's say hello. Oops. First to Guillaume Poutier. Hello, everybody. How he was uh, having a walk in the vineyard and Guillaume Poutier is a direct, the uh, director of, uh, of the estate of Carmo Brion. 
Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> How are you? We're good. We're good. Well, you have nice sunny weather in Bordeaux now. We are stuck in the office. Uh, yes. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I'll go back inside for the tasting. No worries. Uh, the, we the weather is amazing uh, for the moment, but it's great. We need, we need sun after this long period of rain. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Guillaume. Bye. Um, so yes, he's a general manager. Uh, actually, Guillaume Poutier is uh, used to used really to work on the technical part, but now he's like the general manager of Carmo Boyon means working both from like uh, in, like in the, in the vineyard in the technical part vinification, but also on the on the sales and development. Um, and so I was talking about Jean de Potac. So let's go back to the history. Uh, in the 16th century, Jean de Potac was so this um, this honor of uh, Carmo Boyon and Aubryon. So it was the same uh, the same place. And then what happened for us at Carmo Brion is that this Jean de Potac, the owner actually gave it, offered actually Carmo Brion. So it was a small part of Aubryon to uh, what we call the Carme, the monks. So there were, Carme, there were monks living here that, that he offered this six to seven hectares to these monks. And these monks during two centuries, they produced, they took care uh, actually of the vineyard during that time. Then if we talk about the history again, uh, so during two centuries, they produce the wine here. And then during the French Revolution, the, the vineyard was confiscated by the French uh, government uh, for like the most one, one century. And then after that, uh, a new family arrived to, 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 to purchase the estate. Uh, it was uh, Léon Collin at that time, his name, but actually it was uh, part of the like family who took care of Carmo Brion until 2010. So actually after the French Revolution, you had only one uh, family of honor. Um, and uh, in 2010, the current owner of Carmo Brion, so it's called like Piché Group, is a real estate group in Bordeaux. They purchased, purchased um, Carmo Brion so in 2012. So at that time, it's like a new beginning. It's a new start for Carmo Brion, of course. Um, and now I'm going to go on the other side of the estate to show you what happened after they purchased this. So in 2010, of course, we have a new owner. So it means that we have new investments, of course. Uh, it was the goal. And uh, they've decided to create like a new history for, for Carmo Brion. And maybe to add a bit of modernity here. So I'm going to show you first. I'm going to show you first what we could call like a castle, but it's not really a castle for us because compared with, for example, very big like castle in the Medoc, it's not exactly that because it's way like smaller, but for us, it's the perfect size. It's a, we, can, we could call it a house also, but big house. And this is what we have here. So this was built in the 19th century. Uh, so um, by the owner of uh, Carmo Brion after the, the French Revolution. So in 2010, uh, when the, the Piché group purchased Carmo Brion, uh, the, the, actually the former owner of Carmo Brion, uh, she was still living in this uh, small castle or big house <laughs> um, until last year. Okay, so it means that we had during all that time since 2010, like really like still the owner living here, which for us is very important also in the, in the history of, of Carmo Brion. But after the purchase, also the Piché group, they decided to build a new cellar because what happened at that time in 2010, when they bought Carmo Brion, actually, it was at that time a super small cellar, which was not um, enough in terms of equipment, in terms of like, like technical facilities for Carmo Brion to build this new project. So they had to build this new cellar, which was designed by a very famous designer in France and Europe, maybe you might know him, but not sure. It's called Philippe Starr. He's a quite famous, uh, very famous actually designer here. So they designed and built this uh, uh, cellar um, to respond to the new needs, to the new, um, to the new technical demands of the, the new team. Okay. So Guillaume Poutier, that you just uh, you just met um, in the in the vineyard. So the, the general manager arrived in 2012. So two years after. Uh, the, the new group bought the estate. And uh, so this is with him that they decided to really uh, build uh, this new cellar. 
So I will show you from this point of view, but you will see that later when we will go uh, inside, actually it's, um, it's quite bigger from here. It's small, it seems small, but it's, it's not at all. Um, so uh, from this point of view, and this small stream, small uh, river that you can see here is actually like a natural river called Le Pug in Pesac Leonion. And this is a small uh, river actually crossing all the Pesac Leonion uh, appellation. Okay, because I told you before that we are in Bordeaux, but still we are in Pesac Leonion uh, appellation. Once again, I mean, the location for us is very important because we say here at Carmo Brion that we produce, uh, that we make wine of places. I say places because we have two places. We have the places of Carmo Brion, so here with less than seven hectares actually, and 100% of these vines, uh, they will produce and they will go like in the wine of Carmo Brion. And then we have other um, vineyards, other, like, it's one vineyard now, but we, uh, we bought the, the, the different plots of vines um, in uh, like different uh, years. Uh, so in 2013, 14, and 17, it means that uh, this is a, a new cellar for CD Carmo Brion. It's more what we call in Martillac, let's say, it's more like maybe a classical terroir from Pesac Leonion, because for example, this vineyard for the C, C de Carmo Brion is located between Smith-Solafit and Aubay. So really two different places. Let's say that from here, from Pesac, from Bordeaux, our first neighbor is Chateau Aubryon. And for C uh, de Carmo Brion, it's more like, a, uh, it's more like classical Pesac Leonion uh, with Aubay and the Smith-Solafit as neighbors. So for us, once again, it's super important because we really have different terroirs. And when we say terroirs, it's not only the climate, but the climate is very important, but it's also the soils and also the way we are going to work uh, the wines. So to, just to, to show you now, maybe because in very, I think it's a very interesting um, stage in the vineyard, we are now at this stage when you can clearly see um, the grapes here, it's a Cabernet Franc uh, from the vineyard. And so you can see. So what happened this year actually in the past 10 days, I as I told you before, it was quite uh, like uh, rainy. And so we have very, very nice berries. Okay, because thanks to this range, we had first, I mean, if we talk about the, the whole vegetative cycle of this year, we had first a quite hot period, and then uh, no, a lot of rain. So as you can see, we have very good conditions for the grapes, but you, as you can see, the berries are quite, quite big, maybe bigger than last year at the, at the, same, at the, same, uh, at the same period. Okay, so now I think it's time for us maybe to go in the, Cellar, and I'm gonna explain you how this works inside. And of course, Eilis and Emerson, if you have any question, please feel free to ask. No, I, I think I think the the walk in the chateau is really amazing, and I was looking at the building from uh, Philip Stark. The, yes. Um, the material, the altar material of the uh, the building is yeah, it's it's interesting at how it reflects. At, at exactly. Angle, yes. It reflects. It's kind of aluminium, okay, mm -hmm. as a, the type of uh, material they use for that. And as you can see, there is one man, and the the last, yesterday we like once a year we clean. The wall building because this reflection that you can see here is like much more visible when we clean the when we clean the cellar and it was yesterday so quite lucky again but yes it's very nice reflection you can see actually the, the park the garden all the, like the reflect on the cellar yes so yes we, we show you at the other view it, it yeah it's uh the reflection yes. came up very nicely mm -hmm. i'm gonna go inside now or that, you know that they are still cleaning the. Oh, bonjour. Okay, and now we are inside. Okay, so most of the time people say that from the point of view outside, it seems like the cellar seems quite small. But once inside, as you can see, that the vat room here we are in the vat room. It's quite big. 
So actually, what happened with this cellar? So we have different levels, okay? So here I am, of course, on the on the first ground, and we have the vat cellar. Unfortunately, today I cannot bring you like in the barrel cellar, which is like under the what the, the level of water because we have no Wi-Fi and no 4G because this is under the water. But it's it's uh, it's very nice. And here, so the vat room. So we, the, 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 they finished to build actually this, uh, this cellar in 2016, but they managed actually to produce the first vintage in 2013, uh, 2015, okay? When it was still under renovation, but for the vast, vast cellar, which was like the priority, it was, uh, it was ready. We have, as you can see, different type of vats. In total, 27 vats here. So stainless steel, then we have wooden vats, and then concrete vats. We have the I, the vats too. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, I'm going to yeah. show you something. So actually, the idea was to start in 2015. Actually, for the first vintage produced in the new cellar, they started to paint on this vat. So this vat is the 2015 vat. Every painting that you can see on the vat, you will find you know, the, on the back label of the bottle of Carmo Brion, this painting. So it's a picture actually of the vat that you, you will find on the back label. So for example, 15 on the back label, you can see this painting. Okay. This one was painted by Arasta. She's the, the designer's daughter actually of the cellar. So he, he, we, we, they, they had this choice at that time, you know, to, to make them working like in family for the vat cellar and for the first vat to be painted. Then we had the 16 retain. So Later during the, the tasting, for example, we will test the, the 16. Um, probably you cannot see this on the back label because you have, you have very small uh, bottles and containers of, um, of the wine, but I will have the bottle so I, can, I will show you on the back label later. Then the 17, this one is a tribute to um, the former owner. So her sur surname was Bijou, as you can see here, which means Gerald. Uh, so this was a tribute to her. And then you have the vintage 18. So the, 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 30s, the 30th the thirty anniversary that you can see on the vat actually it's not linked to the Carmo Brion history but to the honor actually because thirty years represents like the the, the creation of the uh, real estate group Piché. Okay, so they decided to 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 do this painting with this anniversary on the vat. <laughs> so this is uh, this is for the vat cellar. Actually, I mean, in general, um, at Carmo Brion, we want to work with this idea of complexity. So that's why, for example, here we have three types of vats, okay, with all the different um, materials, because we want to find the, the we want to find the complexity. So most of the time, we will do all like the vinification, wine making with the stainless steel vat. But depending on the vintage, maybe we'll use a different different type of vats. Same for other um, activities in the cellar during the year, depending on what they want to do, what they want to do with this vintage specifically, they will, they will just use different, uh, different vats. And 27 vats actually is a lot if we have to compare with only the less than seven hectares that we have here. But because we are doing specific uh, wine making here at Carmo Brion, we need uh, a lot of uh, room, a lot of space, and many, uh, many vats. But I will explain um, later what is so specific about um, about this um, wine making. Well, there is a compliment here coming from Nimi from Epicure, and she says uh, these yes. vats are beautiful. Thank you for walking us through them. Ah, <laughs> perfect. Thank you. So you know, all the I mean, the architecture was very important here. At Camembert, when you see that, so we have this floor with the, the vat rooms, and under the, the level of water, the barrel room. And as I told you before, so the, the Guillaume Poutier, the general manager, is both working, you know, on the, on the technical part, but also on the, on the sales development part. So he wanted to have his office for him. It, it really makes sense for us to have the, the office here. So upstairs, so this is where I'm going to go. Uh, we have an office and an, uh, in another part of the. Of the vineyard, but for, for him it was super important to be close to this uh, to this technical part and to the um, and to the vinifications and uh, and that cellar and everything. Okay, 
a, bit, a view from here because it's quite nice also. You know, you can see here the top of the vats. And here. Okay. And so now, here in the office. Okay, you can see my wines are ready. And I'm gonna switch here. And hello, everyone. So I'm back here. I think it's, um, I can show you also, maybe it's nice actually to show you here the view from the windows here because you can see the vineyards. Everywhere actually in the cellar, they've tried to, 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 to build and to think about this kind of window so that from everywhere, when you are sitting or just standing, you can see the vineyard and the view and you can look after the vineyard all day long. And here you have the reflection of the perks of the stream in the, in the cellar, so quite nice. Okay. It's such a beautiful environment. Yes, it's, I have to say that it's really, really nice actually <laughs> to, work, um, <laughs> to work here. <laughs> Of course, <laughs> because really, really, Thermobrion is like a small jewel, like at the heart of Bordeaux. When you arrive here, like it's really so, like so peaceful. I mean, you are still in the city, you're surrounded by the, by like by houses, by people living here. But when you're inside, you know, inside this this, this wall that you can see, like uh, when when we looked at the, at the vineyard, it's, it's super super calm and it's very very nice uh, environment and of course we want really to take care of this uh, of this um, environment it's uh, very very important for us um if it's still i mean clear for you you can see me and hear me clearly i think i will not switch in my computer and what do you, what do you think emerson in terms of uh... <laughs> we can hear you very clearly yes very clear so perfect so so i, I will uh, i will not uh, change uh, anything and so we, we can uh, we can continue talking about um, Carmo Brion. So the idea for me now um, it's before we taste the wine I, I, I want I will try we strive to really explain you here what is the, what is the philosophy here at Carmo Brion because I think it's very important to talk about philosophy while talking about Carmo Brion um, because this is the, the really beginning of this story. So if we go back in 2012, when uh, Guillaume Poutier, uh, the director, uh, the general manager of uh, Carme Orion arrived here, um, what he did here, I think he just took into consideration really different parameters from the climate, from the vines, from the terroir, from the soil. And then he added maybe an idea, a style of wine he wants to make. And this is how I think this a project started to 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 burn really. It's very important because he wanted to do things with singularity. He wanted to do things actually to do a wine to make a wine which looks like the place. And once again, the place I think it's a, it's really important for us. If we take about like the the the, the general uh, like philosophy of Carmobrion here, it's quite clear. But uh, it's to make a great wine. But I think make a great wine. No, in Bordeaux, I see. Um, I believe, and I'm sure you know that um, every wine strive to make a great wine. We are all doing a lot of like improvements, uh, trying to 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 understand the place, to understand the terroir. But here, really, it was very very important since since the beginning. So make a great wine for us, and I think I will specify what is for us the definition of a great wine. It's to make a wine um, which gives Pleasure first. I think it's super important, and we, we never have to to, to forget that uh, a wine with we, which gives pleasure, um, and then um, uh, emotion uh, very important as well, and a lot of singularity. Actually, we want our wines to be light for what it is. Uh, we don't want to to look like our neighbor or Brion or Smith. No, we really want to be Carmo Brion, um, and we, we we try to listen to this place to this terroir. Uh, to to success actually to, to be successful actually in this search of of um, of singularity and in search of making a great great wine so this is very important what I have to specify about the place actually and why also we are like uh, we have this singularity 
first we are at the heart of Bordeaux, this I, I told you before, and we have a, a, another thing very important in terms of grape varieties, because here the grape varieties planted in the vineyard, the majority is Cabernet Franc, okay? As you may know, Bordeaux, it's always a blend of grape varieties, but having a majority of Cabernet Franc planted here at Thermobrion, it's very unique. It means that we are the only one on the left bank actually to be planted with the majority of Cabernet Franc. All the other estates in Bordeaux, uh, you will find with the majority of Cabernet Franc, it's going to be on the right bank, and especially in Pomerol or Saint-Emilion. So you have uh, la, la Fleur, you have Cheval Blanc, you have Ozone. They have a majority of Cabernet Franc. So for us in the left bank, it's very unique and it's very important because we have like having this majority of Cabernet Franc planted so we have the same results in the final blend. It means a blend with, with the majority of Cabernet Franc. We have a very specific aromatic. Okay, so this gives you an idea of like, this is very like, uh, this is very specific because when you smell Carmobrion, it's specific about the place, the location, because we have this climate and we have Cabernet Franc. So really for us, it's, um, we are very lucky and we want to, 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 work, um, to work on that and to really take care of this Cabernet Franc because for us also at the same time is the perfect grape variety to match with the climate we have here, okay? So we have early, like an early maturity every year here at Carmo Brion, uh, being at, uh, at the heart of the city. So to give you, like a very, to give you an example, um, there is a, like a big difference of... Uh, average of temperature between Carmobrion and CD Carmobrion. So this is, there are like our two wines, but between these two places, it's a huge difference. For example, um, as you may know in Bordeaux, like uh, three months ago, we had a, like a frost period, so it was very complicated. When here at Carmobrion, the coolest night was minus like a one or 0.5 degrees, it was minus four to five at CD Carmobrion. It means that between our two terroirs, you have a huge difference of temperature. At the end, it's very important for us to have this very specific climate and specific uh, grape varieties uh, planted because it allows us to use uh, different winemaking techniques. I explain, and you will see there uh, during the tasting, that um, we can use here what we call like, uh, at Carmobrion, I mean, the, the wall clusters or the all bunches fermentation. It means that because we have a very good maturity uh, when we harvest, actually the grapes, of, of course, it's all hand, hand picked, but when we harvest, we can keep the stem, I mean, the stalk of the grape for the vinification. So usually, you know, in Bordeaux, what they do is that in other estates, you harvest the grapes and then you de-steam. It's like, like you take the berries off from the stem. We don't do that. Only if we have like very, very um, ripe and the perfect ripeness of the, of the stem. This means that we harvest and we put like the whole bunch actually in the vats. Okay. Only if like the, if the, the, the bunch, if the stem uh, has reached like the final step, stage of maturity. Okay. So it means that when we harvest, the grape, like the stem is not green anymore it's turned into like a brown or red and when we actually store the grapes okay we have like sometimes green stems and sometimes red stems and we are going to keep only the stems when it's red or green uh, when it's red or brown when it's green we don't we just steam and then we put everything together so we have different layers actually in the vat we have layers of only berries when you don't have the stem and then layers with Wall, the, the wall bunch. And we use uh, this kind of winemaking. It's not very common or traditional in Bordeaux. Most of the time it's in uh, other regions in France, you can do that, in, like in Rhone Valley, in Burgundy sometimes, even in Loire Valley, they have this, um, they use this type of, um, uh, of winemaking. But for us it's here, it's perfect in terms of, I mean, in terms of aromatic in the wine we want to bring. And it's perfect for the idea of the wine we want to we want to produce. So this is very very important for us to have this specific soil, this specific terroir, and grape varieties to use uh, the whole bunch uh, fermentation. So this is the first point, very very important. Uh, and then I will talk about another specificity during the during the, the wine making during the, the vinification. But 
maybe before, and because I'm talking about this winemaking, we don't want to do differently just to do differently. This was not the idea. The idea was to listen to the terroir and to have an idea like in mind, to have a style in mind of wine you want to produce. And I think today in Bordeaux, and for Carmo Brionto, it's very important for us. We have a big challenge, which for us, the challenge of what we call the drinkability in the wine. Of course, you know that in Bordeaux, um, and this is a Bordeaux DNA, that's for sure, we have uh, wines with a really great um, aging potential. This is Bordeaux, okay? The terroir, the Lozad winemaking, the Lozad, like the, the aging in barrels, it really allows uh, for us to have this great potential of aging. But at the same time, I think maybe like in like recent years, like new, maybe younger technical team, there is this idea of having maybe, to, of having like a longer drinkability in the wine. I'll ex I explain that I think sometimes it's people mind you can open a bottle of Bordeaux only maybe 15 years after bottling. This is true because we have a great potential of aging, but at the same time, you know, for us at Camembrillon, we want to manage to have like to extend the span of drinkability. So it means to be able to drink the wine maybe in like like younger vintages, but also 20, 30, 40, 50 years after aging. So this is very important for us. This is a big challenge because what we believe actually is first, if you manage to produce a great wine, a great wine must be good all the time. So what we want to do, for example, if you decide tomorrow to open a bottle of Carme Aubryon, let's say 2016 for the vintage, of course you can say, oh no, it's way too young. It's, you, you, you won't have the drinkability. You're going to miss the wine. It's going to be a wait. It's not true for us. We want you to be able to open a bottle of 16, for example, and to say, and, and, to, and to feel that, yes, it corresponds to a great wine, to the definition of the great wine, which means a wine we give emotion, pleasure, with balance, with elegance. This is very important. So of course, you, you won't have the complexity it will have with the years, with the aging, but at least you can find a great wine. And I think it's a very big challenge for Bordeaux. And it's really not easy to have, um, to have wines um, with the drinkability in early vintages. So actually, all the choices we've made during the winemaking, during the vinification, also is to reach this goal of this nice drinkability and good drinkability all the time. So of course, uh, the whole bunch fermentation is part of this of this work, is part of this idea of having a, a good drinkability. Why? But for example, because when you use a wall bunches, what happens? So you have two main things, actually. The first thing is that the wall bunch, uh, when it's in the vats, actually the stem, the stalk of the, of, of the bunch is going to release uh, water during the vinification. And then by another phenomenon, it's going to take back like take back the alcohol uh, during the vinification it means that carmo Brion here since the vintage 2013 we have the same level of alcohol is 13.5 so you can alors, it's not for cd carmo Brion, but for carmo Brion, you will see later um while tasting the wine 14 16 17 13.5 of alcohol because um using this whole bunch fermentation we kind of control the level of alcohol in the wine and it's very important for us in terms of the balance we want to reach in the wine, okay? We have nothing against like, like estate producing wines with higher level of alcohol. It can be super good in Bordeaux as well, but for us, the good balance today between the alcohol and the acidity and the fruit in the wine with 13.5 is very, very good for us. So this is the first point. And can then we, when you Alice, use... Yes? Yeah. Shall we start some tasting together so that we can actually sure. associate... Yes. Yeah, Professor. Yeah, because I think what you point out about the drinkability, what you point out about the 2016, the 2017, this morning when we were doing the we were doing a rebottling, yeah, we thought that um the wine was showing lovely. So I think sure. I think with a little bit of tasting, we could actually associate what you're trying to explain to us. Perfect, perfect. So let's start. Um and then we'll do from a 12. Uh, 14, 16, 17 uh, to, to continue the, the tasting. So I have the bottle here, no? So, so which one do we start we... first? A C. C. C, yes. In French, we pronounce C, so sorry, it's my fault. But C, yes. So C, 17. 
And this is the property between uh, your neighbors, Smith or Lafitte and um, Obaye. Sorry? Your neighbors. This is neighbors to Smith or Lafitte yes. and Obaye. Exactly, exactly. So, c'est des carmobrillons. So, just a minute, I think it's better now. Yes, ah, you have the technical sheet, it's perfect. You just switch on my computer now because, hello, I'm coming up. Wait, before starting, just a second. No. Yes, I will just switch. No, I think it's, it's more convenient for me to do the tasting. I switch on my computer. I have just one second. So I just... For C, it comes Aubryon, the C yes. patch. Is it Cap Sef or Cap Franc? So actually, the big difference between Carmo Brion and Cédé Carmo Brion, I told you before, is about the place, okay? So in terms of philosophy and style of wine we want to make, it's the same thing, it's the same team. But it's not the same place and it's not the same uh, grape varieties planted. So... For Cédé Carmo Brion, we are more like a classical blend from a Pessac Lognon, which is like mostly, as you can see, um, Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. And just every vintage is approximately like this with 1% of Petit Verdot, which means that we don't have Cabernet Franc at all for Cédé Carmo Brion. We have a totally different blend. But what is like funny when I first discovered the wine from the estate here, Cédé Carmo Brion and Carmo Brion, I was really surprised because actually it's not the same terroir and it's not the same grape varieties planted. But at the end, in terms of aromatic, in terms of aromas you can find in the wine, you can have sometimes something very similar. So it's not because actually this time is not because of the place, but because of the work, okay, they are doing in the wine. Because same for Cédé Carmobrillon, we are using wall bunches, so it's always like a lower proportion of wall bunches during the, the vinification because Let's say that mostly the Cabernet Franc is a very good vintage for the super, super um, to, to obtain a very, very good ripeness, which means that we use more wall bunches for Carmo Brion than Cédé Carmo Brion. Okay? So this is Cédé Carmo Brion. Um, Cédé Carmo Brion 2017 actually is, um, is very important also for, um, for, for the estate, I think, in the history because they really reach, I think, the type, the type of wine they wanted to do. Um, from the first nose, people sometimes, it's, you can think that C.D. Carmo Brion 2017 is not a wine very typical from Bordeaux by, by the nose because you have, you know, a lot of aromas. It's like even a, a bit of spicy. So you're like, you can be a bit surprised. But then when you taste the wine, for me, you really find the elegance from Bordeaux. So very important. And the blend is a very typical blend from Pesac Leonion at, uh, at the end. So 2017 was a quiet, you know, cold and um, like cool and rainy, quite rainy vintage in Bordeaux. So it means for this wine, for example, we had like maximum 10 to 15% of wall bunches during the fermentation. But for us, 17 is a vintage that really represents the new, uh, the new start of, of Carmo Brion. As I told you before, Guillaume Poutier arrived in 2012 and uh, for us, it's already like the new the style of wine we want to produce on new, the new cellar. So we start with this wine, but then what is very interesting, we will start later 2012. So before they, they, they actually build the, the, the former building. So you will see the difference. So 2017, Cédé Carmobrion, you have a lot of freshness. Maybe it's linked to the vintage, quite cool, um, quite rainy as well. But also at the same time, they really succeed to have a, a lot of fruit, and uh, you have a very nice acidity in the wine. It's very, it's you have this for me. It's you know very light wine, but at the same time, you have this very nice, very nice elegance. So once again, in terms of wine making, so ten to twenty percent of um, wall um, of wall bunches. Then for the extraction, very important here at Carmo Brion and for C C de Carmo Brion. We really want like very gentle extraction. And actually, we do know what we call here like the infusion. Infusion means that we are not uh, doing like the traditional extraction um, that Bordeaux used to do, actually. But we are doing infusion. It means that we are not looking for the extraction, but we just wait for the extraction to be done by like itself. It means that 
We don't do pumping over, we don't do pigeage, okay? But we call infusion, it means that during the vinification, you, you know you have the solid part, so which like called the cap, and then the must, so the juice, and we just push the cap down the vat and we just wait for the infusion, okay? So it's, it's another way, you know, to, to go uh, to this extraction very like it's pushing to the extremes a very gentle extraction okay but when we do that actually and what once again it's linked to our idea to make wine with a great drinkability you work on the tannins quality which is very important so this is a work that we started to do in 2017 for Cédé Carmo Brion and you will see later again when we will taste Carmo Brion 16 and Carmo Brion 17 that really with the infusion it's really important to you really work on the texture, uh, you know, in the wine. So it's it's very important for us. And then for the aging, and I think after talking about the aging, we can go to to Carmaubrion. The aging of CD Carmaubrion is also very specific because it's not like um, normal or regular aging, but we do super long aging for CD Carmaubrion, minimum twenty four months, okay, for CD Carmaubrion, and then plus six months again after the barrel in the vat. Okay, in the stainless steel vat, so stainless steel or concrete vat is different. So we use a French oak barrel, of course, of one or two wines during 24 months, plus then six months in barrel, because why? Actually, C de Carmaubrion is not a wine we want to release on primeur, okay? It's a wine that we want to release when the wine is ready to drink, okay? So that's why we are not in a rush and we can have a very long aging like in total 30 months of aging and then we release the wines uh, when it's ready to drink. Okay, so actually the C de Carmaubrion 2017 was a living age we have released here um, on the market. Very generous and, shorts on the palette. Yes, on the palette. Maybe another thing I didn't specify is that for us, C de Carmaubrion is not a second wine. Why? Because just like it's very simple, it's not the same place. So when it's not the same place, actually in Bordeaux, you say your second wine, when you do, for example, you have one place and then you're gonna do, I'm gonna take this plot for the first wine and this plot for the second wine. This is not what we do. Actually, we believe in complexity. It means that for Carmaubrion here, like the seven hectares, even if we think like maybe this year, there is like just one plot, we don't have the perfect whiteness and etc. It doesn't matter. We put everything together and this is with like this is putting everything together that we can find the complexity. Okay. It's like in a family, sometimes you can have like a, a like a like different uh, yeah, one, one brother like he has a great job working in finance and then the other one maybe just an artist. I mean, it makes the family thing more complex. That is, we believe the same thing for the wine. So it's very important. So that's why we say it's not a second wine, it's just another wine from, from, from here, from the estate, that we do with another place, but with the same team and with the same philosophy in terms of winemaking. So if you're ready, we can move to um, Calme Brion 2012. Oh, you're going to start with the 12 first? Yes. OK. No, so, uh, sorry, I was, no, no, we start with the 17 yet. I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> because I didn't put the bottle in the white order on my office. It's okay. <laughs> of course, we with the, with the younger first and then we'll go to 12. Actually, it depends on the, on the wine essay. Sometimes uh, we, we did uh, sometimes uh, starting with 12 and 17, it really depends. But uh, you will see actually it's, today it's very interesting because we have all these vintages, and all these vintages from 12 to 17. It's represent different like period of the estate, and we will have like big changes since 2012. Okay. So ready for you? Yes, we are. So actually. Um, what happened? So 12, I told you before, it was uh, like the new general manager. It was the year he arrived. He arrived during actually the harvest. Okay. So it's really the first vintage, um, like since the new story here at Carmo Brion. Uh, and this is when actually we started to, um, to use the wall benches. So first vintage, just a very like a small proportion of wall benches. 
And at that time, and this is why it's very different than between 12 and 14, you will see, it was not um, a majority of Cabernet Franc, actually, in the, in the blend. It was a majority uh, at the time of, of still uh, of, um, of uh, Merlot. Um, so it's, um, it's two things at the same time, actually. They, um, it's also the way you want to work with your vineyard. It's very important because sometimes, even when you have uh, like a, like before 2010, if they had like a majority of Cabernet Franc planted in the vineyard, in the final blend, sometimes you didn't have like a majority of this grape variety, but you had a majority. Um, you had, for example, a majority of uh, Sauvignon or Merlot. It was just the way of working because no. At Carmont Bellion, we really want to take care of the Cabernet Franc because we believe it's a vintage with it's a great variety, which is very good for the for the aromas, for the aromatic we want to give in the wine. So we really want to take care, and if we can, we will replant some Cabernet Franc. But so at the time, 12, it was a, a majority of Merlot, then Cabernet Franc, then Cabernet Sauvignon. Okay. So 2012, actually, it's very interesting vintage um, for sorry. Are we tasting the 17 or the 12? So it's actually up to you. We can do both, but at, at the end, we can start it with the 12. Okay. Also, oh, we're doing a 12 now. I mean, it's, we, we can do both when, because today we don't have, you know, if I, if we had like vintages before maybe 2010, it would be like uh, difficult to start with the very young, but between 12 and 17 today, actually it's interesting to start maybe from like the beginning of the story. And then to finish with very like uh, recent young vintages, but if you want, it's like really okay between twelve and seventeen to do you know both ways. But we can start with twelve, yes. Okay. So that yeah. what is it is that we we can do the history like from the beginning and then to the recent vintages. Okay, we'll do because I taste a little bit of the seventeen. I'm gonna pour my twelve. If okay, I can, so not if I can remember, yeah. If I can remember correctly, I think what's interesting is that. 12 doesn't have much of the whole bunches, right? Exactly. It was like among the, the vintages we are going to taste, no, it's like the, like the smaller like proportion of, of, of uh, grape variety stating. Actually, if at home or in office, I don't know where you are, no, if you have actually many glasses, you can, what will be the best actually is to pour a bit of the wine in each glass and then you can compare because I think it's, it's very, it's very interesting. Um, so let's do let's do with twelve. If we take the, the history, so first year of the new general manager, just like a, like a low proportion of of um, of the wall benches. Um, what is very important for us here, and this is going to be the case for every vintage, is now from twelve to seventeen. There is one big obsession for the wine vine grower now is about the water management. Okay, I think in our generation, uh, and it's quite difficult because we must adapt to all the climate changes. Of course, the water management at Carmaubrion is so important. Why? Because when you want to produce, to make a great wine, actually, uh, in Bordeaux, you must maintain what we call the hydric restriction. It means that from the bud burst, from the bud break, you know, from your, the, the whole vegetative cycle, you want to maintain the perfect hydric restriction. It means you don't want too much water in the soil. You don't want uh, like a lack of water in the soil. So actually, the great job of the wine growers now is really to maintain this very good balance. If you maintain this until I mean the harvest, you can like harvest like the perfect ripeness of the grape and harmony and balance. And I think really the water management uh, it's super important nowadays because. You, you, you can really you can really harvest the perfect maturity um, in the grape. So what is very interesting while well, starting with, uh, with 2012 actually is that um, for us and among these vintages is going to be like the perfect example and like the perfect expression of the terroir here. So as I told you before, with the arrival of, uh, of the new general manager, and so maybe the, the, the start of this of the new story of Carmo Brion and uh, with the new actually uh, winemaking and the, and this really idea of and this the style of wine we want we want to make. So for the blend, you have uh, like a forty four percent Merlot, 
you have 38 Cabernet Franc, and then the rest of Cabernet Sauvignon. And so you're going to see like the difference then after, like from 14, there is a big difference between like the, the, two, uh, the, the two blends. We were, we were talking about drinkability before, and I think 12 actually is a, is a, is a good example because I mean, after tasting, you can see that this is a wine that, of course, we could say is a perfect time to open this bottle. That's for sure. You can, you have the fruit and you have this, you have this pour, but with a lot of fineness, like a lot of elegance at the same time. But when you have this pour and it's 12, of course, you can imagine that this wine, you can like still keep it for years, maybe 20, 40, 50 years, maybe. And you will see that the wine will be like still perfect with this super, super nice freshness and very dark fruits. So of course, between C. de Carmo Brion 2017 and Ocarm 12, like there is a huge gap. Of course, C. de Carmo Brion was a lot of like on the, on the aromatic, on the, on the fruit uh, with a very floral nose when no, of course, with a 12 and like it's a, it's a wine, uh, um, which has some, so some years now, you have more complexity. What do you think, Alice? First, first impression. Well, actually the first impression of all the wines is um, the bouquet are very alluring. It's very, very generous fruits in the bouquet. And, um, tasting it because I tasted my 12th and my 17th side by side after a while you could feel that um, 17, 17 shows the freshness obviously like you say it's a much younger vintage so the berries the freshness of it comes through whereas the 2012 the nine years of aging in the bottle basically brings out a little bit more of the undertones and you get a little bit more of the musty flavors that's coming out from the 12. But yet, it's the character to the fruits flavors is still holding it well, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, if Freddy know, we can compare with the uh, 14. Yes. Uh, Alice. Yes. We have a question here. Uh, sorry, Alice Liu Ren. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a lot of Alice today. <laughs> so, we have a question coming from me, yes. and she asked, what sort of yields do you pick up at Le Carmes? Uh, in terms of yields, you mean like, uh, so it's a good question and it really, yields really depends on the vintage. Um, like uh, if, I mean, I don't, have a, I don't have the exact yields of 2012, for example, but um, I will explain how does it work here. So we have here like uh, at Carmo Brion, for example, 10,000 vines per hectare, okay? And what we can do, I mean, like with the perfect condition, for example, for a vintage, we can go to like 50, um, 50 um, hectoliters per hectare. Okay. This is, let's say, simple, like the maximum we could do is 50 uh, hectoliters per hectare. Okay. Then, um, okay. and then um, for 12, Vintage could be like between 35 to 45, okay, in terms of it's so really different and really depend on the vintage, which time, which type of uh, climate conditions uh, you have. For example, 2020, we have like a second part of the vintage, super hot, a lot of sun, and the yield was like a 33, 38, like 38 uh, for Carm and 33 for CD Carm Brion. So really depend on the maintain, but the maximum with the perfect weather condition could be up to like 50 hectoliters per hectare. This one that if we can produce a lot of wine, we, I mean, we, we, we would like, we would love to do it every year, but unfortunately, the climate doesn't allow every year to produce that type of yields. Does it reply the, the, the question? Yes, you did. Thank you. Perfect. So we can, um, I'm going to pull the 14 now. Yeah, I've got my 14 and 16 in front of me too. Perfect. What was the weather like for 14? So 14, let's say 14 was, um, we can say, quite complicated vintage, maybe. Um, 
is uh, you had the you, you had let's say compared of course to to 15 cool vintage and a bit rainy so let's say today among these vintages 14 and 17 for example would be similar like similar vintages with rain so what i like actually in this type of vintage you can have like a lot of freshness very very nice fruits for 14. typically for me sometimes it's like you know when um when it becomes a complicated vintage, it's a classic vintage. Uh, so you kind of compromise the longevity of the vintage to, to drinkability. So with that kind of conversation, would you say it should be ready for drinking, say, within the first five years? And in terms of ageability, you're looking at more 25 years rather than the 30 to 50 years mark? So, so, sorry, Alice, but uh, I could not hear you. Ah, okay. So, um, for a for a vintage like the fourteen and yes. the seventeen, yes. So, uh, we may call it a more challenging vintage. We may yes. call it a more classic vintage, uh -huh. where um, exactly. the style are more early drinking. Yes, so when it's more early drinking. We talk about being able to approach it in the first five years. Mm -hmm. But yes, actually, I would say, and that's for sure that, for example, when you taste a 40, no, it's a, it's a vintage, which is ready to drink, but it doesn't mean that you don't, you don't have the great potential of aging, because you have this like uh, like specific aromatic, uh, which comes from this vintage and, and the winemaking, but at the same time, what is very important for the longevity and the aging is a balance between alcohol and acidity, okay? And I think... This vintage 14 was a perfect balance between these two parameters, okay? But yes, you're right. At the same time, it makes the wine more accessible in early vintages. And this is what we love also in Bordeaux. I mean, you have a new wine every year and like according to the vintage, but you can open a bottle now. And yes, that's for sure. For example, compared with, with the 15, 15, yes, was like super, like a hot lot of sun. And when we taste snow, yes, maybe it's, less approachable, we have less accessibility and, and the wine needs more time. But for 14, maybe because of this freshness, because of this super nice fruit, I mean, you have, you have this very good, uh, this very good drinkability already. What I love in the 14 at the same time is this, you have a very nice uh, texture, you know, it's very, like you have a lot of uh, velvet tannins, it's super silky wine, which give a very, very nice mouth feel. I'm, uh, I'm not sure if you got time to read actually the, the blend, but no, we really are like in the majority of uh, Cabernet Franc. So with the 44 uh, with the 44 percent of Cabernet Franc for 14, which give you maybe another nose, a different nose, different type of aromas. You have maybe more fruits. It's more floral. Uh, okay, Alice, uh, we have a question coming from Mr. Ying Xian Tan, and he asked, when did Stepan de Renancourt become consultant to the estate? When de Renancourt became consultant? Yep. It, it, was, in two, it was in 2008, so which means they were already like the, like the consulting like company for Carmo Brion, uh, like before the, the new owner bought purchase the estate, okay? So they're starting to do, to do this work and we are still uh, working with them uh, for, for this consulting. So okay. many, many uh -oh. times in the year they come to see the vineyard, to see the vinification, to taste the wine, so really important. Okay, and there's a follow-up question coming from Mr. Tanigan, and the question is, how much more replanting of the vineyards has occurred since 2010, and what has been the change in the proportions of the varieties which have been replanted? Okay, so the idea actually is when, uh, I mean, during the, the life, like replantation, the idea was just to, I mean, to, to replant and to manage to have more uh, Cabernet Franc, but I mean, it didn't change in terms of hectares, you know, so since they like bought the, the estate, like, the, I mean, it was already like before 2010, less than eight hectares in the vineyard. But the idea, and because also the terroirs alone, and because we have the perfect soils for this Cabernet Franc, is to replant with more Cabernet Franc because it's really um, corresponds. Um, it really corresponds with the style of wine we want to make today. 
Then for C, the Carmobrion is really different. And because we started to buy the new plots in 13, then 14, then 17, so it's a totally different story for C, the Carmobrion. But talking about Carmobrion, we like really kept the same, uh, the same uh, number of hectares, but we've changed a little bit the amount of Cabernet Franc of grape varieties uh, in the vineyard. So as I told you before, once again, we are not afraid about complexity. And for example, we have younger vines here at Carmobrion, but we keep these younger vines with the super old vines to do the final blend, to bring complexity in the wine and to like co-vinify all together. So this was for the 14, 14. You had a proportion of um, wall bunches was approximately 30%, okay, with this vintage, which is going to be the same, for example, with 17, because you, you had like the same type of uh, climate conditions, but then you will see that it is more for 16, for example, it's a higher proportion of, uh, of wall bunches. Okay, in the 2014, um, just a few words maybe about the about the aging at that time we we're like still like doing aging with like big barrels and barrels but we didn't start the unfurls in 2014. so you will see that in 16 and 17 is a new uh, idea a new work around like all this uh, aging process because we will have like we have no three types of different containers uh, so barrels big barrels food and then unfurls for for the aging so that started only in 16? With the new with the new cellar. Yes, exactly. With the opening, with like with the start of the, the building of the new cellar. Ready to move uh, with the 16? Yes. 16. So 16, totally different approach uh, for this uh, for this vintage. Um, I think it's important maybe to remind now that for us, 2016 is really part of the great wine vintage of Carmo Brion. Um, first, because I mean, in general, it's a great vintage in Bordeaux with very good weather conditions and so super, super year. And at the same time, I think for us, it's really the, the, the beginning of the new winemaking process, uh, really we manage this vintage to um, to like to obtain the style of the, the kind of wine you want to make to, to obtain this new style in terms of um, aromatic brightness I think it's very important this this work aromatic brightness because we are looking for this uh, aromatic brightness so um, very very important and so it means like a vintage uh, produced in the new cellar with the new um, with the brand new equipment so the new vats the new um, barrel cellar for aging. So it's really like the, the, a new different era for, for, for us. Okay, Alice, uh, there's another question com coming from Eugene. And the question is, when did the use of Amphora start? When did it start? Yes. 2016, or maybe 15. I mean, they've managed to uh, to produce, you know, as I told you before, to produce, I mean, the first uh, vintage of Camo Brion produced at Cam was 15. Uh, and then for sure, 16, they really uh, started to work with Amphoras. Okay. So no, I mean, the difference, if we really take no, uh, I mean, recent like vintages um, produced at Cam, uh, there is again something new. So as you can see on the, on the technical sheet here, it was at that time like, uh, uh, clay on for us, so terracotta on for us, the same. And now we also have the use of um, sandstone on for us. I mean, working with on for us, for us, it's very important when talking about the energy in the wine, you know. While using on for us, we can really keep freshness and the fruit and a lot of energy in the wine. So I think it will probably remain the same proportion of on for us uh, in this uh, aging. So now we are about like 10% of on for us. Um, and the uh, like, for the technical team, it's what we, I mean, it's what we want to do now, to have aging with barrels, in big barrels, and then for us, we find for us the perfect balance and complexity at the same time.
Because I've always understand that, you know, in terms of um, uh, aging in the different the, 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 the different vessels. So oh. for for oak, for wood, you get a better exchange of oxygenation. And then I think for a uh, stainless steel tank, you basically don't add any no, yeah, zero. Exactly. And exactly. With the mm. forest, you get consistency of temperature and that. Yeah. Um, so so the technical director, do they decide on it could be different varieties going to different types of vessels? It could be a different vintage. That's why that is that is causing the the, 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 the different reasons for using the different vessels. Yes, sure. I mean, you know, um, first I think there is no one reply because you really adapt, of course, every vintage type of first winemaking and then hygiene you want to do with the wine. Uh, but yes, like years after years, of course, I found out that this aging, bringing a bit of amphoras, you know, really for us help to, to, to obtain, like to obtain and keep the freshness in the wine with the, with the amphoras and everything together. Once again, it's very important. It's the complexity, you know, I show you like the vat cellar is a three types of vats and then the aging and like the barrel cellar is three types of vessels. So very important. And you were talking about oxygenation. Um, yes, actually, what is interesting is that, for example, you know that a bur like, a, like a normal new oak barrel and then the clay amphora, at the, at the end, it's the same oxygenation, almost the same, let's say. But with the clay amphora, you're really going to keep, like, you know, the, you know, the freshness and the, and the primary aromas for the fruit. But when talking about uh, sandstone and for us it's like zero oxygenation it's the same as stainless steel so once again you know they add, they've added like recently the sandstone and for us because they believe that sometimes with just a very 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 small proportion of the wine aging in sandstone means that you can keep even more energy and freshness in the wine is there any small little side experiments and side projects that that determines like what kind of varieties goes better and um, what is the development and the evolution of that? Yes, I mean you know every year. I mean, I think for like uh, the technical team every year is a new experimentation. That's for sure, and um, you know that we do like a first blend. I mean, as we you know as we do the vinification already with all grape varieties blended. It means that we do like a kind of a first blend before the final blend, okay, during the vinification. And then, of course, uh, before the final blend, we are going to taste each, like, uh, each wine, each barrel, and each container. And then this is at that precise moment that we can see, ah, yes, the wine looks like this only with the, I know, with the barrel, with the food, and the wine looks like this only with the amphora. So at that time, it's kind of experimentation, and you see the type of aromas, you see the, the type of um, evolution the wine is going to have with the different types of, uh, of vessels. So 16 for us, so as I told you, super, super uh, Great vintage for us. You have a lot of elegance. For me, it's like the perfect, it's super fine tannins. I think it's very important. You know, we were talking before about the infusion. We don't do extraction anymore. Working with infusion really helps you to improve your tannins quality. And I think 16 is a good example of this work we are doing in the cellar. You know, it's still super young. Of course, 16 is the young vintage. It's still a baby, but at the same time, you have drinkability. You have super fine tannins. You have very Grain texture tannins, you know, it's really fine. 16 is a very, very good example to me. Yes. Blend also is the majority of Cabernet Franc. And, you know, it's only like among the vintages we've tasted before, only the 12, but it's not a majority. No, it's also 41% uh, of uh, Cabernet Franc, and then you have 30% uh, of Merlot and the rest of Cabernet Sauvignon. 39 Merlot. Okay, Alice, uh, I'm sorry, but there is a follow-up question uh, pertaining to the amphora, and the question is coming from <laughs> Eugene. And the question is, uh, do you use the soils from the estate to make the amphora? <laughs> no, we don't do that. Maybe one day, but no, we still have like a normal like, suppliers for the amphora. But yes, we know that uh, some uh, states are able to do that, but no, we are not, we are not uh, doing that uh, uh, I think we will probably need another team uh, very like dedicated to this kind of project maybe one day. <laughs> if one day I will let you know. 
<laughs> well, it could be, and you know, I told you before, like briefly that I mean, actually, we have a lot of clay in the soil here. It's, I mean, it's really part of, and it's one of the specificity. We have a lot of Cabernet Franc in the, in the vineyard. This was, this is very unique. But especially, we have planted the Cabernet Franc on clay soil, which is very important. And we were talking about water management before. Why it is so important? Because I mean. We try by ourselves, by the team, I mean, to maintain the hydric restriction during the whole vegetative cycle. But at the same time, the clay does this like naturally. It means that the clay, for example, and 2020 was a very good example. We had the first part of the vintage very humid, so a lot of rainfall, high rainfall, and then super dry. So what happened actually with the clay? First part of the vintage, the clay like really stored the water up in the vineyard to give it back to the vines when it was needed. So the clay actually is a great, 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 of course, uh, asset for the vineyard. So ready for um, 17? 17. Okay. 17 has a very sweet bouquet to me. Very floral, a lot of fruits. Yeah, a lot of fruits. Before, vintage, 14 and 17. Maybe not exactly the same, of course, but maybe same profile. And 17, uh, especially, um, quite cool vintage. But I mean, I really, I really like uh, this, this result of a cool vintage in terms of freshness in the wine. And very nice, very nice aromatic as well. What is the average age of the vines? So average age of the vines here, um, at Carmo Brion, we're about like uh, 40, 45 years um, for, for, for the average. But as, as I told you before, we also have like super old vines of uh, like almost like 70, 80 years, and then younger vines. But in the end, once again, what we like is the complexity, having maybe like different profiles of the, of the vine plot. But all together at the end, we really obtain a, a very nice uh, complexity. So the estate will have its own replanting programs. Uh, do, you, do you manage your own nursery? Sorry? Do you manage your own nursery? All nursery? What, what do you mean? Uh, all uh, nursery, do you plant your own uh, vines? Yes, 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 yes. Exactly, they do uh, everything like this, even, uh, you know, for the new projects, the new development, actually, of seed des Carmobrillons, no? We do what they call, you know, the selection massale, which means, like, taking, for example, if we manage to have, like, the perfect terroir, the perfect soils for seed des Carmobrillons, uh, I mean, like, in the new terroir, like, in Pessac Léonion, we will do what we call the selection massale, which means, for example, take the Cabernet Franc from here from Carmobrillon to replant them um, over there. But this is, I mean, uh, not done, and it's really complicated, difficult program because to do that and to, to, to do it like uh, to succeed um, in doing in doing this, you really have to 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 find uh, the perfect terroir, the perfect soils in another place to replant the Cabernet Franc. Actually, I didn't show you the, the back label because we were talking about it um, together during, uh, during the cellar earlier. So this is the 16. So we started in 15. We don't have 15 now, but this is the 16 back label. So this badge, if you remember the painting, painting and then the 17. The 16 and the 17 is showing very well. Oh. Yes. <laughs> ah, yes. We have a nice, uh, nice picture. Thank you. I, I guess Emerson is doing all this. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, for me, I mean, among the vintages we've tasted, you no, know, uh, the difference you can taste in between 16 and 17 is about like yeah, the, the nose, the aromatic, you know, it's really. Is really, I mean, it's an achievement. Okay, it's an achievement in terms of floral laws, a lot of fruit. Um, if they really succeed, you know, with the winemaking we are doing here, with the wall benches, with the infusion, no, you know, to and the use of, of, of amphoras, you know, to keep the freshness, to keep the fruit, 
And what I really like um, in 16 and 17 also is that you can really recognize this one. I think you put the nose in 16 and 17 and then you know it's calm. You know it's calm because you have this Cabernet Franc. The Cabernet Franc gives you this very floral nose, uh, a lot of fruit. Um, also, I mean, in, term, in, in the mall, there is something we really want to, we want to work on that. It's the juicy side of the wine. I think it can be quite weird to say that, but juicy and tasty, it's important for us. You know, the general manager used to work in the Rhone Valley. And I think in the Rhone, when you taste Syrah, Grenache, you taste something, you taste the fruit. You are, really have like the tasty side, really yummy wine in, in the Rhone Valley. And this is something maybe we, we try to reproduce really to give pleasure. I think if you have a wine with a lot of juice and then um, uh, and a lot of taste, you want you want to go back to it. You know, you want another glass. You want to to to, to resmell. You want to retaste. And this is something we want to work on. Yeah, that is very evident in the sixteen and seventeen that juiciness. And uh, when you talk about that, um, yet it has uh, it maintains that freshness, that flight, that elegance, that lightness. So you don't feel the you don't feel that it's a, a weight a punch on you. So it's very very well made between the balance of the the the, the tannins, the fruits and the alcohol. Yes, exactly. Also, there is something. I mean, some people are more sensitive to 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 other, but you have a sensation, a feeling of saltiness in the wine, and you know it makes you salivate at the end of the mouth. But because of the use of wall bunches, you know. When the, when the stem releases water during the winemaking, during the vinification, actually, it also releases salt, like sodium. And then you have this feeling, you have this feeling, sensation of saltiness in the wine. And I think, once again, in terms of drinkability, it's super enjoyable. And if you taste the four wines, the four different vintages side by side, you could kind of feel that stylistics change between the 12 and the 14. And the 16 sure. and the 17. Exactly. Yeah. Let's say that maybe 12 and 14, no. I mean, they, they are really like the expression of the terroir um, and then the start of the use of the wall benches. But then 16, 17, I think for me, it really is really different because of this different aromatic. That, mm -hmm. That's for sure. And the new winemaking technique, the new cellar, of course, helps to, 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 to do that. There is something else. I mean, when you work with them, you know, when, because we are not doing like the traditional extraction, because we are not doing pumping over or, or pigeage, we don't have actually oxygenation even during the vinification. It means that we want to avoid the contact with oxygen during the wall process. During the vinification and during the aging, this is what we call the reduction aromas. We don't want the wine to be in contact, I mean, at maximum to be in contact with the, with the oxygen. So. The less oxygenation we have, for us, the better the aromatic is. And I think this is really important in our, um, in our philosophy and in terms of style of wine we want to make now. And this very floral note that we have um, in the 16 and the 17 not only comes from uh, the Cabernet Franc, but also from this work that we do under the reduction. Very nice note. And 17, I mean, once again, 17 is a vintage. I mean, I love it both for C, the Carmen and no, because yes, you have, you have this vintage, which is quite cool, but the wine, you have a great drinkability. I mean, for me, it's amazing. You can keep the wine, also that's for sure, but you can open this bottle now. Maybe 16 is still too young, because you know, you have super like um, tight tannins. It's, very, it's a wine that is tight. I mean, super, super long uh, finish. But 17 for me is already open. You have this very nice sensation. Of, um, the, the great way, wide range of aromas and then super nice freshness. 16 has a, has a huge potential. I love this nose. You know, it's quite complex, 17 as well. Huh? I mean, uh, you, have the, the, you have the dark fruit, but at the same time, you keep a great freshness. It's super juicy and crispy fruit. Do you know the things about the uh, taking the decision on stylistic changes from a more traditional earthy kind of uh, long aging 12, 12 to 14 to 16 and 17, where the approach is about being accessible to even during the first five years of this life and depending on the vintage to be able to have the aging potential, whether you're talking about 30 years of aging, 40 years, 50 years of aging. Do you think it's um, the technology? Do you think it's the consumer demands 
do you think uh, also is because when um, export business has grown so internationally what are the salary mm-hmm. facilities in the different countries what is the taste palace the yes. need and everything I, I, honestly i would say it's a mix of everything at the same time but for sure maybe the idea here i mean the first idea and when we started to wonder about the style of wine they want to make maybe the consumer's needs for, for me it's very important because we know that in bordeaux we can make great wines that's for sure and i mean so many estates are able to know but yes with this new consumer and uh, i think we can say it sometimes we know what we call the bordeaux machine with some it's very difficult people say i mean sometimes um, yes it's great bordeaux but you cannot open the bottles and um, we don't want this to be true i think there is something very important here at Camorion that the team is very young actually the general manager is young and all the technical teams are very young i think i'm not too old and same for the rest of my team. <laughs> <laughs> no, but for the technical team, being young, I think it's important. Um, because yes, they had this dimension, I mean, this notion of, yes, I think, I mean, we make great wine in Bordeaux, how to make it more accessible in yoga vintages. I mean, for us, it's, it's, it's very important. And so, of course, um, by using different types of winemaking, we can, we can succeed. I mean, this. Um, but yes, maybe the consumer, I mean, this is very important for us because we don't want to, to target, uh, I mean, only the same type of, of people. We want to target, like, we want to have, like, super wide target, actually, of people. And we have two types of wines. We have Camogrillon, we have C de Camogrillon, and we want really the wines to, to, to be accessible. And I think our generation, we are more and more connected. You know, you can have access to any wines with your phones, with some apps, and um, people, I think, got more interest about the wine. And um, this is very important. At the same time, I'm sure that even in France, so many other great wine regions, I talk about Burgundy, I talk about Rhone. Um, I mean, they all produce amazing wines, but maybe with the, like earlier drinkability in other regions. So I think it was important for us at the same time to show that we are able to, but at the same time, we also have this great DNA of having wine with a huge potential of aging. So, but the consumer need, I think, was very important uh, for us. Yeah, because interestingly, like, you know, over, especially for me, the, um, we had a chance to taste um, the 2020 premiere in our office. We got some samples sent over to us and we were amazed at the drinkability of it, you know, whether or not it was accelerated because of the, because of the, uh, the amount of sulfur that's been put inside to balance the wine and things like that. Yeah. I was amazed at how you're able to, to balance the wine, to be able to show yes. the wines at a young age. Mm. I think in Bordeaux also, what um, there is a big change about the tannins. You know, we used to do maybe, I would say two things, maybe work on tannins and then aging. Okay, we used to do maybe in Bordeaux in general, very yeah. kind of too hard extraction. So it means that very fast, very quickly, you are looking for the extraction, so a lot of tannins. So it means that when you were tasting the wines during en primeur, it was, it was hard, you know, it was... Uh, uh, it was difficult to, 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 to appreciate the wine because of the tannins. But at the same time, when you have a lot of tannins, you have a great potential of aging. And second, I think people are maybe changing their mind about the aging process. You know, we are doing aging process with 100% Europe for Sedeca Montbrillon, but maybe it's a long aging, but we are not, look, like we are not looking for um, wood, uh, like wood aromas, but just trying to have a very good integration of the of the wood aromas, okay. So, for example, I think this year en primeur, especially, uh, it was already well integrated, okay. So yes, but the work on tannins, that's that for sure. All the winemaking process um, regarding the extraction, very important in Bordeaux because we used to waste it maybe too much and too fast, and now we are going toward like a gentle extraction, and that's why also the wine can be more accessible. It is, and, and nowadays I find that, you know, that fine grainy tannins, yeah, it's, um, it's very lovely, even at a young, even, even when it's a young vintage, you know, uh, mm-hmm. when you're able to integrate inside there, whether you have it by itself, whether you have it with your meal, your cuisine and so on, yeah. Mm-hmm. 2020 for Camobrion is a very good example of grain texture, okay, with insane like powder, 
10 in, yeah. super fine, super fine. And of course, it's uh, of course it's way. And it's not because you have super fine tannins that you can keep the wine in the time. Of course, you can keep it, so it's it's perfect. But the grain texture is very true for Carmel Brion. And I think you can feel it in, in the 16. You still have a lot of tannins. You have power, but it's very controlled power. And it's very grain texture of, of tannins. It is, it is. And I think I think for Singapore market, I think uh, we are all very affluent drinkers of Bordeaux because of the accessibility of information that we have over here, whether it's over the internet, whether or not it's via, via all the critics. Uh, we have a wealth of information that uh, we are able to get and um, the taste profiles, the maturity of the clients, yeah in terms of the varietals, in terms of the development, in terms of the techniques, all the different vessels. I think oh. we are pretty advanced in it over here. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. I think, I mean, it's very important know in every wine region to, to find your singularity, to find your identity through the place and through the idea of, I mean, of, of the philosophy of the style of wine you want to make. And yes, I mean, for us, I think, for the wine estate, it's more interesting to work with like singularity specificities. And for the consumer, it, of course, it's more interesting at the same time because you will remember that, ah, this one you've tasted, there is this specificity, this terroir, and this grape variety. And I mean, it's a win win situation, I think, for everyone. But more and more, I think people are going to go back to the terroir and maybe try not to listen too much to the critics <laughs> <laughs> and then to do what they want to do. I mean, like this and we are very lucky in past vintages we have great scores great from great critics it helps that's for sure but i hope also we can continue having our own idea of the one of the one we want to make and if one day it doesn't please one of the critics it doesn't matter okay we we, we we continue with the same idea i think that's definitely the case i think i think for the clients in singapore um no doubt the critics helps us to give a platform to like, you know, and an idea on what it is. And mm -hmm. until we have the chance to taste the wine, to speak to you directly, yeah, we will be able to form our own mind on what was Comes Aubryon like before the change and what's Comes Aubryon like after the change the, and the reason for the change and, the, and what has caused the change. I think that is very important in terms of knowledge. And from there, we'll be able to make um, judgment for ourselves. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. And um, I think, um, thank you very much for your time. I think um, before I end the session, I always ask this question. Yeah. Um, what is, uh, what do you have in plan or what the Chateau has in plan for the next one to two years that we should look out for? Ah, it's a very good question. Unfortunately, everything is so secret, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think there is one thing I can tell you about is maybe some very specific formats like container we are going to do you know in uh, 2016 uh, Carmo Brion uh, produced what we call like the Marie-Jeanne I'm not sure if you see what is what kind of, it was actually a bottle of 2.25 liters oh. uh, only 500 um, uh, bottles uh, that, uh, that we did at that time um, we are going to do probably something not the same, but probably different for 2017, which means that in uh, September or October, we will release like a new different format, like new bottle, big, big bottle of Carmel Rio. So this is one of the first project. And then I hope, I mean, as soon as it is possible, you can come here. And of course, if you are in Bordeaux, please come and visit us. And we will have a new project with the castle I showed you before during the tour because, you know, uh, as um, the, the, the former owner just uh, uh, passed away last year, uh, no, uh, the, the, the chateau is, um, is, is, is free, is empty, and we are going to do something uh, with that. We don't know what exactly, <laughs> uh, but we hope, of course, it will, it's going to be a place for, uh, for Carmo Brion to welcome people, to organize uh, maybe events, tasting, I don't know, whatever, but this is going to be something new uh, on the estate, so very important for us. I think that sounds lovely. Well, um, to the guests, to the clients that actually attended this tasting, um, you have an order form over there, but I just want to highlight that uh, we, one click, we are doing on Premier 2020 as well. So if you're looking for any Premier 2020 Vintage, please yeah, send us a note and we'll be able to make you an offer directly. So, 
great. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Very, very, I mean, we are very happy to, to share the wines with you in Singapore because we know, I mean, the condition is not easy, but usually, I mean, we would um, travel and we would be there to do this tasting. But anyway, it works. You manage to taste the wine. I think this is the most important. If you need anything else, just uh, feel free to ask uh, Alice and Emerson from one click and I will be <laughs> to, to reply uh, even later on. And once again, feel free if you are in Bordeaux to come and visit us. All right. Thank you, everyone. And uh, have a good have a good evening ahead. Bye bye. bye.